Bibles this evening, let's turn to Ephesians. We're going to be looking at a few ideas uh, from, or from a few passages in just the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking uh, all in the book of Ephesians. We'll start in verse 17 of chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 17, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts. I was thinking about this this week, that phrase, uh, Christ dwelling in your hearts. You know, there are some people that get bent out of shape when you're saying, hey, you know, um, don't ask Jesus to come in your hearts. We're going to have to cut out this passage because Paul is asking that Christ may dwell in our hearts. And in fact, uh, in Galatians 2.20, the Bible says this, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I yet live, yet not I, but guess what? Christ liveth in me. So I, maybe it's not in his heart. Maybe you're saying, hey, you know, ask him to live somewhere else. But um, Christ does dwell in us when we're saved. He does come to dwell with us, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that's by faith. All right? It's, it's something that... Um, it's, it's an act of faith, and it says that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, so we're going to talk uh, about five functions of the Holy Spirit found in the book of Ephesians. Uh, there's more than that found in the book of Ephesians. We're just going to consider five of them here this evening. There was a, a young lady who was soundly converted, and she began to read her Bible. And one of her uh, friends, uh, you know, when she was unsaved, now she was uh, leaning away from being a friend. But one of these folks came up to her because she saw her reading, and I don't know if it was at work or at some time, and she saw that she read her Bible a lot, and she ridiculed her. And one time she said, why do you spend so much time reading a book like that? And the lady who just gotten saved said, well, because it's God's Word. It's the Word of God. And the girl that was unsaved looked at her and said, nonsense. Who told you that? What kind of what statement is that? It's God's word. Well, after a moment, the girl, and she didn't know much. She had just gotten saved, and she looked at the unbelieving friend, and she said, well, who told you there's a sun in the sky? She looked at her, the scoffer, and said, well, I don't need anybody to tell me that. The sun tells me. And she said, well, and that's the way God's word does for me. It tells me his word because I feel its warmth and I sense his presence when I read it. And that can be misunderstood. It can be taken out of context. But we're going to talk about the Spirit. There's a misunderstanding a lot about the Spirit, and there's a misunderstanding about Christ. There's a relationship between Christ and the Spirit, a lot of it. Christ went into heaven, and he left the Spirit here for us. But the whole purpose, and this is what you have to understand about, under, uh, talk about, and teaching on the Spirit. If, if there's an overemphasis of the Spirit without an addressing of Christ then something is wrong. Because the whole purpose of the Spirit is to point people to Christ. And that's biblical. All right, I don't have time to get all into it here, but I think I will show you some of that just in the book of Ephesians. Here in the book of Ephesians, uh, I love this book. As I'm, I'm starting to study it, we're going to be coming up to it in October, and we're going to be diving through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, uh, many uh, folks have talked about Ephesians. William Barclay was a well-known uh, commentator, and he said Ephesians was the queen of all epistles. Uh, the English poet Taylor, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge termed the book the divinest composition of man. Uh, John Mackey was a president at one time of Princeton Theological Seminary. He was converted at the age of 14 by reading the book of Ephesians, so he had a very special uh, kinship towards the book of Ephesians. And he said this, he called it the greatest, maturest book for our time, the most relevant. Ruth, uh, Ruth Paxson 
Uh, she was a missionary to China, I believe, Ruth Paxson. I, I can't remember if it was in the 1930s or in the 1800s, but uh, Ruth Paxson was a missionary, and she called Ephesians the Grand Canyon of Scripture. Because she said that as you dove into the book of Ephesians, it was breathtaking and it was inexhaustible as far as the wealth that you could get out of the book of Ephesians. But as we come to the book of Ephesians, I want us to just consider a couple of things uh, kind of quickly tonight. A lot of times um, our Thursday nights, because of our prayer time, uh, is, is compact. So I'm going to try to put it compact, and then you can think about these things. But we'll notice five things. The first thing is found in Ephesians chapter 1. You look at um, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ... In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the say, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And then, uh, so two things that come out of this, verse 13 and 14, it says that we, we were sealed unto uh, we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. So one of the functions of the Holy Spirit, it, you will always see it in connection with Christ. And that's why I, I just warn you, if somebody is talking about the Holy Spirit and they are downplaying Christ, something is off. That's why the Pentecostal movement is off. That's why the Charismatics are off, because they lift up the Holy Spirit. The whole purpose of the Holy Spirit is Christ. That's the whole purpose. That's what he's here for. He's here to uh, draw us closer to Christ, conform us to his image, and to realize the fullness of Christ. And you see that in Ephesians chapter 3. We read that verse. That's what Paul, he says that the, you might be filled with all the fullness of God. How is that going to happen? By understanding through the Spirit, Christ more. And so discounting Christ and lifting up the Spirit is not, is not biblical. So what, what is this saying? One of the functions of the Spirit is it assures us of ownership. He assures us of ownership. And, and this is what happens. So, so this, we get saved. We trust in Jesus Christ, and it says we are sealed unto the day of redemption. So what does that mean? What is the sealed unto the day of redemption? One man, I think his name was Thomas Hodge, a commentator, uh, divided the idea or studied the idea of a seal, and he came up with three, three purposes. And I want to share that with you. He says... Three purposes. A seal is used to confirm an object or document as being true or genuine. Secondly, a seal is used to mark a thing as one's own property. The third way a seal is used is to make something fast or secure. And we have, in, in our society and biblical ideas, we have all three of those as illustrations. For instance... In the United States, you have something, a document, that shows it to be genuine or true. If you have a passport and you, you show the front of your passport, what is on it? It's the seal of the United States. What is that saying? It's saying that this passport is genuine. Why? Because it has the seal of the United States on it. Now, we all know that there's fraud and all kinds of different things. But even in, in a dollar bill, what do they do? They put all kinds of things in there so that what? It's proving that it is genuine. All right? It is true. So in the same way, what does the Holy Spirit do to us? He has, he has been given to us to show us that our salvation is true. It's genuine. 
That's one of the evidences that you're saved. Whenever you're doubting your salvation, you need to go and, and beg and get into Scripture and say, all right, I trusted in Jesus Christ. And you, you say, all right, Holy Spirit, I need that assurance, that, that truth, that genuineness. That's one of his jobs. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. All right? And then the second one. All right, the second is like a, a nameplate. All right, and in uh, my library at my house, I bought one. And so my books that I get, I have a stamp that I put usually in the front and back of my books. That way, if somebody comes and uses my book or they borrow one of my books, and five years from now, they open it up, that conviction will come deeply upon their heart and soul because they stole, and it says, from the library of Steve Dameron. All right, why is, what's that seal saying? It's showing that this is mine. Okay, it's my book. All right, so what is the Holy Spirit when he's in me? He says, I am Christ. That's what he's saying. I am Christ. And believe me, I, I believe this as far as biblically. I believe the devil knows that. I believe the devil can see when he looks down and he sees through and he sees your heart. He sees a seal of the Holy Spirit and it says, that's God's. It's no longer yours. Now, it doesn't mean that he's not going to mess with you. He's going to try to mess with you. He's going to try to cause doubts. He's going to try to get you, um, he's going to try to get you uh, doubting that you're saved, not having assurance. The Holy Spirit is given to us. He seals us. Unto the day of promise. So what is the seal? It confirms we're true, we're genuine. It also says it's marking us that this is, this is uh, God's property. The third way we realize the seal is to make something fast or secure. This is illustrated by Jesus Christ. Remember in the tomb. The Roman soldiers, what did they do? They sealed the tomb to make it what? Fast and secure so that there was no way that the rumors that were out there, that the disciples were going to come. Well, they said that there was going to be a resurrection, but we're going to seal this because some of the disciples are probably going to come and steal his body. What were they doing? They were making that tomb fast and secure. Now, what is beautiful for us is the Holy Spirit. Salvation is secure. Amen. It's not an unknown. It's not something that like, oh, well, I, I, don't, I don't know about if I'm saved or not saved. Really, my salvation rests in the finished work of Christ. Not in anything that I am doing. In the finished work of Jesus Christ. So I'm resting on him but I have the Holy Spirit. He's been given to me. Why? Because he can assure me. He, he, is, he is showing that, I, that my salvation was genuine. He is showing me that, uh, that I am God's. But then also, he's making it fast and secure. The second thing that we see in this uh, passage as far as the Holy Spirit is found in verse 17. We went down and it says, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit. I believe this is referencing the Holy Spirit. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge. Remember what I said, what's the job of the spirit? It's to point to God and point to Christ. Mostly to Christ. So what does he want you to learn? Him. Christ. Um, and then notice in verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? To usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And notice he goes back to this idea. So what does, what does the Holy Spirit want to enlighten you about? It's always, it's scripture, it's the truth, and that is scripture, it's Christ. All right, but it's, it's not just, uh, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't just want to enlighten you about which car to buy. 
Like, yeah, I'm going to pray. I've been in fasting and prayer because, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm referencing it again. All right, so some of you are going to be like, he's fixated on that Maserati. All right, but is it a Maserati or is it a Buick? Like, oh, I need to fast and pray, and hopefully the Holy Spirit will give me wisdom. No, you know what? I don't believe that he's going to give you wisdom in that, knucklehead. All right, I don't, I don't think that what he wants to do is give you wisdom of the scriptures, wisdom about growing in grace, wisdom about this God and the power that's available. Notice in verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. What does the Holy Spirit want us to do? One of his functions. Right? is to assure us of ownership. He seals us unto the day of promise. He wants one of the functions of the Spirit is he gives us wisdom. What is this wisdom? In, in verse 19, this is interesting, and I'm going off of what somebody else has studied, okay? Because I am not a Greek scholar. They say that in the New Testament that there is six words for power in the Greek. And in verse 19... Four out of six are used, and it's talking about the power that is available to you and I. To me, that's amazing. It wasn't enough to just say, hey, there's power available. He used four out of his six words. What does he say? What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power? All right, so greatness and power and working of his mighty power. I mean, it's unbelievable. That is what's available. And what did all of that? The wisdom that the Holy Spirit wants to give you is, is that power raised Christ from the dead. And it's available to us. In Christ, it's available. That's what the Holy Spirit, we always, I think sometimes we, we confuse just the Holy Spirit. We want to make it all mystical. But the Holy Spirit and, and Christ, it's, it's kind of together. Why? Because they're three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so was it, was it God that raised from the dead or the Spirit or Jesus? Yes. Yeah, I think it was. Because Christ, it says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Now what's interesting is that heavenly places. That's another phrase that's found numerous times in the book of Ephesians. Sometimes we think of it as just like, oh, up in the heavenlies. Right? But that heavenly uh, places, this is what's interesting. We find it there. We find it in a couple other places. But we find it also right, that he is raised and he's sitting at the right hand in heavenly places. What does that sitting indicate? The sitting indicates that his job was done and that he's on a throne. What does that tell you about Jesus Christ? He's victorious. He finished his job and he's a victor. He's a king. And he's sitting in heavenly places. What's interesting is we find that same idea, the same Greek word found in Ephesians 6 and in verse 12. Because it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. Guess where? That's the same word as heavenly places. So you know what it's telling me? I don't have to fear the devil if I'm in Christ. In Christ, he is seated and he gave him a kick, a boot to the head. All right, using an old 80s term, he gave him a boot to the head. All right, that's actually a Genesis term too, Genesis 3. He bruised it, he thumped him. And in Christ, we don't have to fear the devil. In Christ, and, and this, is what, this is what happens to us. We get all fearful because the devil is out to attack us. And it's a spiritual battle. So in the flesh, we fight back. Forget the flesh. Understand the wisdom that the Spirit wants to give us. And the Spirit says this, this power 
This fourfold power that he's describing, right? Uh, four, uh, uh, he's using four different types of words to describe the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And he's seated because he's victorious. That is the wisdom that the Holy Spirit says, it's available. Stop fearing the devil. Stop giving in to him. Because you can have victory. That's the power that is available. That's the wisdom that the Spirit wants to give you. Then look at chapter 2 and verse 18. Chapter 2 and verse 18. It says um, in verse 13, let me back up, but now in Christ Jesus... Uh, again, I say that phrase is just catching me because in Christ Jesus, you find it all through Scripture. I'm finding it. You know how they say there was a big study that when you buy a, a red car, all of a sudden you notice everybody has red cars? Okay, or when you, uh, but they say it's just because you're focused. Well, this phrase, I'm, I'm seeing it all over the place, all over the Bible. In Christ Jesus. But it says, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. All right, and then verse 16, that he might reconcile both us or both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him, that's Jesus. I wanted to put it all in context because through him, that's in Christ. What happens in Christ? We both have access by one spirit unto the one. Notice the Trinity is all right there. That's why I say it's the people that want to uh, split it all up. I want to understand the Trinity, and I understand that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but they work together. They don't work separate. They, wor they are working together to make us conformable to the image of Christ, to make us victorious. So what is, what is one of the functions of the Spirit here? It says... And that he is able to aid us in our prayer life. The Spirit, remember in uh, the book of Romans, it says sometimes we don't know what to pray, but who helps us? The Spirit. I think that's Romans 8. In Romans 8, he says that the Spirit comes alongside. And so the Spirit can help, help us, and that's why. But this is what I think sometimes we get off on. We, we're always talking about the Spirit and Spirit and Spirit. We forget that Christ and the Spirit work together. And so we think that, hey, I, um, I don't have to be right with Christ because Christ came in and made me anew, and he deals with salvation. There's nothing else. All through the book of Ephesians, what you find is I'm in Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. Christ lives in me. He abides in, I'm supposed to abide in Christ, according to John 15 and 16. The Spirit helps me do those things. He aids me. But what stops all of that? Your sin. You can, you, you step out of Christ when you choose to sin. And that's this world. I'm not talking about, all right, in the future, all right, in heaven, I am, I am in the heavenlies. All right, that's said in this, uh, in this passage. Uh, it's, it says that Christ has blessed us. In chapter 1 and verse 3, he said he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All right, in the future, I am perfect. But here on this earth, I have this flesh. And this flesh doesn't like to follow rules. It doesn't like to obey. It likes to do its own thing. And the spirit is there to say, no, 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 no. Live in Christ. Submit to Christ. And he'll help you. But I step out of being in Christ. You're on your own. And that's why some, you live in failure. Because on your own, uh-uh. Go ahead and try it. And you know what? Self, that, there's, some, there's some toughness we can have sometimes in our own character. 
I would admit that. I mean, I would hope that, uh, I would hope that in my own character, I would get up in the morning. I can't guarantee it, but I hope I would. Do you know people that are unsaved that get up? I do. A lot of them. And they make lots of money and they're good business people. Well, so and you say, oh, yeah, I, you know what? I defeated it. Maybe once in your flesh, you might. But what about the next time? And what about the next time? That's why we sing it, the arm of flesh. Guess what it'll do? It'll fail you. It'll fail you every time. It'll fail you, <laughs> maybe not, but eventually it's going to fail you. It's going to let you down. In Christ, though, he's seated in the heavenlies. What does that mean? Victory's already done. It's finished, he said. So the spiritual battle is already won. So claim the spiritual victory. Claim it. And, and what the Holy Spirit helps you do that. The Holy Spirit, he assures us of ownership. He gives us winner, uh, wisdom. He aids in our prayer life. The fourth one is found in chapter 2. And then the Apostle Paul um, starts talking about a building. And we're built upon the foundation. Notice, again, he's, it's the Spirit and Jesus going back and forth. All right, that's what you see in the book of Ephesians a lot. Is it going back and forth? We're built upon the foundation. So what is it the Spirit? No, nope, actually it's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. Himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly uh, framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God. Guess how? Through the Spirit. Guess who's been left You've been sealed, saying that God owns you. When the devil looks, the devil's like, ah, I can mess with him some. But man, God got him. Yes, it's that evident to the devil. And it's, and it's a sure thing. It's not a like, eh, you know, you know, he loves me, he loves me not thing. No, it's a done deal. So I'm, I'm sealed. But then he gives me wisdom. What does he give me wisdom about? About scripture, about Christ, about the, the vastness of Christ, about the, about the greatness, about the, the breadth of his love, about all that Christ can do in, in and through us and living in him. And he aids my prayer life, but then he wants to build me. The Holy Spirit is a builder. That's what he is, according to this. He wants to help us. We have a foundation, which is Christ, and the Holy Spirit is here, and he's a master craftsman that can help us build a life in the image of Christ. You can't do it without him. On your own, you're going to mess up. That's one of his jobs. And then look at chapter 3. We continue down, and you see there as you progress through these different thoughts about the Spirit. But then you come into chapter 3, and he's talking about being a prisoner of Christ um, and the, the grace of God. Um, and then he says in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his, his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And I think I'm at the wrong verse. Yes, I'm sorry. Down to verse 14, for this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, notice what, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So here, just quickly, we looked at five things that the Holy Spirit wants to help you do. He seals you unto the day of promise. He wants to give you wisdom. Wisdom that through Christ, who is the victor, you can stomp out the devil's, the devil's attacks. The fiery darts of the devil, you can throw them down. You have to use the shield of faith, but the Holy Spirit can teach you that. He can give you the wisdom to fight. He can aid us in praying. He wants to come and be a craftsman and build us up and to be a, a holy temple for God because we are the temple. No, you're not. You're the temple of God. So let him build you. 
But then he says, I want to strengthen the inner man. That's what the Holy Spirit can do. Again, I, I close with a, a thought here. And I'm stealing it from an evangelist that I heard it from. I will not name his name because I know the way some of you are, you'd just be like, it'll ruin it. All right, but this evangelist was talking about, and I thought it was a good illustration of uh, the relationship of Christ and the Spirit and ourselves. Let's talk about a, a hot air balloon. You know, there are, there are laws. There's laws of nature. Okay? Um, there's the... And, and, and there's laws. There's laws of sin that uh, you reap what you sow and different things like that. But with uh, this idea of the hot air balloon, what's interesting is that the hot air balloon, guess what it does? It beats the law of gravity. We tried it. I tried it. Now, I was tethered. Praise the Lord. Okay, but there, maybe you've done a hot air balloon, but you know you've, you've seen that in, a, in an airplane. An airplane, what is it? Is an airplane is beating the law of gravity. At least, I hope so, most of the time. It's, it's, it's going to beat it. So this hot air balloon, what happens? It's beating the law of gravity. But how, like with you, how are you going to keep beating that law of gravity? I, and that's why I say this. I, I like the illustration. You have to stay in the basket. As, and I would, just, I would just recommend maybe you have a kid or two that you don't like. And try this. All right, so go up in the hot air balloon and you say, hey, look it, we're free. And you take that kid and say, listen, we have beat the law of gravity. Jump out. <laughs> you know what will happen. You jump out of that basket, thump, you fall. It's the same for you and I. In Christ, we can beat it. But you step out on your own, thump, you're done. That's what Christ can give you, victory. So why not claim that victory? Why not experience that victory through the teaching of the Holy Spirit? That's what he wants to do. He wants to give us victory. I'm not saying that we're going to experience um, never, uh, just sinless perfection. There are some that kind of get bent out of shape. But no, there's not sinless perfection. Why? Well, because this flesh is strong. But there, it should be that as a Christian, as I am growing in the Lord and I'm understanding through the Spirit's work, that it's all about Christ. And as I reflect on Christ and I am giving him the glory, because what is one of the purposes? Look at what he says. He says in verse 16 that he would grant you the riches of his glory to be strengthened. Why? That Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, grounded in love. To know the love of Christ in verse 19. Now look at what he says. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh in us. What is that power? Is it just this spooky spirit? It's the power that Christ gives us. It's in Christ. Now the spirit helps us understand that. He enables that power. But in Christ we have victory. He's already seated at the heaven in the heavenlies on the right hand. Why? Because he finished the work. He is victorious. And in Christ, you can have victory too. And that's what the Spirit can teach us. To have the victory that we're supposed to have. So then what I say is, stay in the basket. Because some of you are jumping out. And man, maybe it's not been tethered long. You haven't, you haven't gotten off the ground long, but I'm, I'm sorry, a 10-foot job still hurts. And some of you, you're repeatedly knocking your head with that 10, 15-foot drop, and man, quite frankly, you're pretty dizzy. You know, I was like, <laughs> well, you come to church, and that's why you're saying amen at the wrong time. You know what I mean? It's just, maybe you're just flat-out dizzy. 
But guess what? God wants to give us victory. May God help us to understand through the Spirit the victory that we can have. We sing it, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. That's the victory that's available. Let's stand with our hands.